in our classes and also discuss the hormonal regulation of the testicular function. And number four, we're basically going to describe, discuss the hormone regulation of ovarian function and the menstrual cycle. Okay, we are focusing more on the ovary and see what actually happens okay, in this case and discuss the hormonal regulation and also maternal changes during pregnancy if she becomes pregnant. But I think this we won't be covering here. I think I'll focus more on the menstrual cycle that uh, she is experiencing. There is uh, Mrs. P. Okay, and discuss the common problem related to infertility. Uh, in this case, we actually have actually done, and also you have actually done your PBL, and that is also related to that. Yeah. Okay, I think now it's already 11.30, only 70 or 80, 79 of you, okay, 80 of you have joined, so we still get another 40 of them. Okay, we just go through the pre-class. So this is uh, Mrs. P, a 30 years old woman, has been married for five years and has not been uh, trying in way to have children since their marriage. That means it's five year marriage, then have not been able to have children, okay? Basically, she works in a very stressful condition, okay, in an accounting firm. And she has a certified accountant and her work is basically very stressful with a tight uh, deadline to met. Okay, so basically that's the main justification why she is having a problem also. Yeah. And then you can actually read all the detail about her basically history. So in the pre-class, what are the possibility that the patient is not able to have children in spite of trying hard to get pregnant? So we normally need to check the male and the female problems. Is there any questions? No. Generally, usually we bring the female rather than the males, and we assume that the males usually have no problem, but there are cases now basically increasing male, not able to produce enough uh, spermatozoa. That basically uh, on the numbers is not enough or basically a, a normal sperms. So that can also lead to the infertility. Okay, so as we should focus. Yes. What was the question wanting us to answer? The question is basically is what is the possibility that the patient is not able to have children? What you are trying to say is basically um when we check about not getting pregnant, especially married couple, is to basically check both male and female and basically have to really check and see what are the main problems that they are facing now. Sometimes you don't, we just focus on the physiological aspect. There can be also some psychological, even emotional aspect that can be also included. Okay, so there are many other things. And later when you become family uh, physician or um, gynecologist or uh, ONG, basically you have to actually look at both the partners rather than put the blame on the female only. So we put the hint that basically you need to check both male and female. Uh, and see what problem that they face. Is that okay, Jana? It's a very general uh, question that we ask you. Yeah, I wasn't sure what they wanted, like to say very low possibility or high possibility or like how to answer it, but okay. Yeah, it's a very general question basically to uh, test. Uh, basically, most people will bring the female rather than the males, and they think that most of the problems actually occurs in the female rather than the male. Okay, so it's a general uh, psychological question that you can answer according to what you think that is justifiable. Is that okay? okay? Yes, doctor. Okay, so we move to the second question. You're basically able to provide the hand-drawn hypothalamus pituitary glands. And this I have actually stated very clearly in the beginning that please do all pre-class activity in your own sketches drawing and handwritten and submit together with your in-class assignment. So I believe you are going to you have actually done that. Okay, so we expected you to draw. So you need to basically uh, briefly draw and how this hypothalamus and pituitary uh, basically influence the production of uh, GNRH and how this uh, GNRH actually function or uh, actually affected in this patient. Yeah. So you can justify your answers. The hint provided basically stress is a major contributor. So how does actually stress actually cause uh, this uh, uh, affect the GNRH production and finally the FSH and LH uh, production. So I leave that. I think you have done that and you have already referred to many other uh, journals and sites and websites. Yeah. Doctor. Yes. Are you presenting any slide? 
No. Oh, no. I just briefly discuss it. Okay, okay, doctor. Unless you have a specific question in the pre-class, then we can go in and discuss it. If not, I will just move on. So question three, and you are able to product, uh, provide basically the repair system and structures, and these are basically, um, I expected the gross and also the histological uh, focusing on the ovary and also the seminiferous tubule on looking at how these structures actually are able to basically uh, produce the gonads, uh, the gametes that is necessary for uh, fertilization to occur. Yeah. So I will leave that to you. So the question here and your question two is, is there a problem in this patient? Could there be a problem in DNRH production in this patient? Question two. Problem Anyone? with GNRH, is it? Yes. Uh, possibly. Possibly, because she's she is stressed. very stressful in the uh, stressful environment. That probably can affect the GNRH production. And also that can affect the, uh, the, the FSH and FSH and finally her menstrual cycle. That's what she had been experiencing before she actually came to see you. Is that right? Okay, so we go on to the question three. Yeah, question three. Discuss. Uh, okay. Yes. So the answer would just be stress could possibly affect GNRH production. I think stress. Uh, deeper than that. Yes, stress is the major factor. Not possibility is the major factor. Um, exactly how. Okay, physiologically. Exactly. Yeah, physiologically. Yes, Jana, before I answer uh, Ruben's questions, yes. Anything? Yeah, it's okay, it's okay. Okay, I will discuss that towards the end of the uh, looking at the major complaint that she has uh, based on her history that she has irregular menses. So how does that uh, be affected by the stress factors? Okay, the main important thing, what hormones is produced during stress? Cortisol. cortisol. Cortisol, yeah. So we know that cortisol is mainly uh, um, a glucose level. Basically, it's a glucogenic uh, uh, hormones that increase the glucose level. Okay, so it's going to basically suppress all the others. That is not a major factor in the um, stress or fight and flight reaction. So basically, like reproduction, all these things will be suppressed. Okay, uh, so doctor. Yes. Yesterday, while I was doing the learning issue, what the question for that in the pre class, they said that cortisol inhibits kids' peptin, which is why GNRH is suppressed. Is it correct? Yeah. Okay. That is a bit more detail if you go into that, but generally, it inhibits the secretion of GNRH. Nah? But how you do that, you can go into a molecular aspect. Yeah. As you Dr. say, uh, yes. Um, is it both cortisol and both CRH which suppress, which suppress the GNRH or is it just cortisol? Yes, yeah, uh, CRH. Mm, okay. Basically, the CRH, yeah. From what I got, doctor, I mean, I read one yeah. article from NCBI. It said that cortisol reduces the effectiveness of GnRH on the uh, gonadotropes instead of suppressing yeah. GnRH itself. Yeah, there is more on molecular level. Okay, but basically, CRH itself has a direct inhibit inhibitory effect on the release of GnRH. Yeah. Whereas you're saying about cortisol is more secondary effect, they basically make it less responsive to GnRH. Is that okay, Ruben? Yeah, okay. But if you focus on basically uh, the, in, the involve of stress is mainly the release of CRH, that basically reduce the uh, GnRH production or influence the pulsatile release of GnRH, that can basically have the effect on the uh, gonadotrop to produce the gonadotropin. Okay. So we will go later and uh, see how this actually can actually affect that. Yeah. And then uh, question three, uh, discuss the disturbance in the pathway for ova to be deposited in the Philippine tube and also the sperms uh, with the possibility in the vagina and also any disturbances during the post fertilization stage. So you can actually refer to that. But since if she is not releasing any ova, basically none of that uh, is happening. Yeah? Okay, but if she is releasing over also, sometimes the stress also can actually affect it because the short period, as we say, is that in during stress, the short luteal phase, it can actually affect the uh, secretory phase of the endometrium that prevent the deposition of the, uh, or the implantation of the fertilized ova. That also can uh, prevent uh, fertilized, I mean, the pregnancy to occur. 
So number four, in the meal replay system, forgot the test is, I think that is okay, you can draw all that. So we are discussing their function, you can discuss that. Could there be a problem with the husband referral system that lead to the failure? So we need to look into the, uh, that can be a possibility problems if the husband is not able to produce enough of the sperms that is required or produce abnormal uh, sperms uh, morphology. That also can affect the fertilized uh, uh, over, sorry, the release over to be fertilized. Yeah. So we have to look on further questions from there, but you can always answer just by your answer. Is it possible? Yes, as I said. Justification mainly if there is a reduced production of the sperms and also the anomalies of uh, deformities of the morphology of the sperms. Yeah. So number five, the female resistance, you can focus on the ovary. So basically now we look at how this primordial, uh, primary uh, and secondary and also the calcium follicle basically uh, happen. So we mainly focus on the oogenesis that is happening or for the, for the follicular development. Okay. So could there be a problem with the patient reproductive system? Just why, what would be your answers? Yes, most probably. Yes, most probably. So we do not actually know that, but we think that could be a main problem. Then we look at the hormonal uh, later. We basically have to check, and as you have done in your PBL, we have to do a lot of these uh, tests to basically confirm that she's having that problem. Some patient actually has only half the uterus, okay, or a normal development of the reproductive system, so it can be a problem. Yeah. Then we discuss the hormonal influence of follicular development and how these are uh, uh, affected during throughout the ovarian cycle. Okay, so I leave that to you. Unless you have questions, if not, I just move on. And then finally, on a question, question six, basically looking at anatomical, physiological, and hormonal changes during before before, during, and also after puberty. I think that's okay. Number seven, define fertility and infertility. So what you understand by fertility? Um, the, ab the ability to conceive children. Okay, by in vitro? Yeah, under normal conditions, yes, in vitro. Yeah, it, it, under normal conditions, in vitro. Even under normal condition, in vitro, you don't consider that as fertility because there is considered she is infertile if you have to do it in vitro. So basically, it must be something uh, in you that must be biologically basically able to perform that function biologically. That means it has to be normal biologically. Okay. But if you do it in vitro, that we don't consider as uh, fertility. Yeah. So, so how about? Doctor, yeah. you mean that if a female has like tubal blockage, but she yes. still has a fertile ova, so yeah. that's considered infertile as well? Yes. Okay. She is still infertile. It means you have to take out the ova and then implant it into the, after you do a, a in vitro fertilization, then you implant it. And this is known as assist um, uh, fertilization. Okay, or um, basically assist fertilization. So it's in vitro, so it's artificial, not a natural process. Then how about infertility? Inability to conceive after one year of trying. Yes, so anything after one year of trial for the female basically is considered infertility. So you can actually explain that uh, further. So anything that is if they just try three months and say that they are infertile, that's not eh? probably they just just too early. Yeah. Okay. Then fewer than ten percent of menstruals are basically there is the in the population they have found that basically most of the female basically they menstruate around the age of eleven, and most ninety percent actually done uh, have their first menses at age of thirteen. Yes. So by the age of fifteen, almost ninety eight percent of all girls has actually reached um, menarche. You can have some actually uh, exceeded that. That means you can achieve almost up to about 16, 17 years of age. So it's called a delayed amenarchy. Yeah? Okay, I think that should be all. And then explains the relationship, question eight, explains the relationship between the hypothalamus. Okay, so doctor, yes. um, since advice, what answer do we give? Like at what age can a girl get pregnant? Yeah, sorry, I didn't answer that question. Yeah, at what age can a girl become uh, get pregnant? That's the thing. When she starts puberty. When she starts puberty. Yeah. Okay. Uh, eight to nine, nine to ten years old, maybe. Okay. 
but that doesn't say that she is having the first menses or menarche. Okay. So basically, when she has the first menses, then maybe. Yes. Usually, the first menses is a uh, over. That means there is no over uh, being released. But once you have the menarche, there's a chances of her to get uh, pregnant is higher. So when she have the first menses, then the chances she is likely to get pregnant. So it can be as early as 11 years and as late as almost 15 to 16 years or 17 years. So if the milaki is delayed up to about 16, 17 years, then basically uh, she will only get pregnant after that age. Okay. So it's possible that women, uh, I mean, girls get married. I mean, in some culture or some countries, they actually marry as young as nine years old. Is there likely that she is going to get pregnant? No, um, depends on whether she got her menses or not. But I so at the end, yeah, I guess you no. Nine is yeah. That's true, Jenna. So it, it has to depend on the first menses that she has. If she has it at nine years, then yes. But generally, as we say, is that she can have menses as early as um, eight years. Okay, but most fewer than ten percent actually have that earlier than eleven years. Yeah. But now the menses is actually getting earlier. I mean, the first menarche for most girls are now getting earlier to about eight years. Okay, I don't know, maybe in another 10, 20 years, it can get to seven years. Then if you, the girls marry as early as seven years, then it's likely she will get pregnant. Okay, so give you logical reasoning on predicting the age. So you give the logical reason mainly looking at menarche rather than at puberty. Puberty doesn't mean that she has the first menarche, yeah? She can develop the secondary sexual characteristic, yeah, but she has not has the menses, uh, the first uh, menarche, then uh, she doesn't have menarche, then she will not get pregnant. Okay. Number eight, explain the relationship between the hypothalamic pituitary control of ovarian function. I think that should be very clear now. You are, should be very clear on how this is able, basically regulating the ovarian function, but in the question, we also ask you on that. So what is the possibility that the patient is having problem related to the hormonal influence of ovulation? Is there a possibility? Yes, no? Um, yes, yes, doctor. Yes, there is a possibility that the patient has that. It's actually related also. The first thing is basically she do not have or she has depleted her follicles. Or basically she has very little amount of... Uh, uh, ovarian reserve when she actually reached her puberty that is also the reason why she is not able to uh, ovulate then the hormonal influence is not there for ovulation to occur okay so you can give all the possibility uh, discussion now we look at the case uh, so we look at the past history basically she has uh, no neurological disease, uh, disease so we want to look at anxiety depression all this can actually affect the menstrual cycle okay and also, there's no history of any diseases of pelvic or abdominal surgery, no extensive weight loss. Why does extensive weight loss can actually affect men, uh, menstrual cycle? Maybe it's an indication of ovarian carcinoma. Yeah. If you look at the weight, actually, our adiposa is releasing the hormones called leptin that can actually influence the menstrual cycle. So if there's the extensive weight loss, basically, uh, there will be less leptin that has been released, then it will actually affect the um, menstrual cycle. Okay, then you look at drugs, alcohol abuse. Uh, she, uh, she has mums at the age of 14. For men, it's very important because it can affect the testis, so it can cause orchitis, inflammation of the testis, so that can actually uh, reduce the sperm production also. Yeah. Okay, so she slept an average of five hours per night, so she must have a very short sleeping time, so it's not very good. She's younger of the two siblings, a sister who is married has two children, so there's no such uh, problem with the, with the sisters. But her mother has history of endometritis and also hypertension. That could possibly uh, link to probably her also have some sort of genetic link, but her sister is uh, okay, okay. Sometimes within sisters, there will be variation in genetic content. Yeah. Okay, now physical examination says 165 weight about uh, 52. So her BMI is a bit low. There's 
I think it's too low actually. Yeah. Do you think she is fat? I think it's quite normal. It's quite normal. The, how old is she? 39. How old is she? Sorry, just check that. 30. I think it's a bit too low actually. So she is actually underweight. John, do you agree? If she is uh, less than 20, then yes, 19 is okay. Or even 25, I think it's okay. But if beyond that, basically she is underweight, I would say. That could, that could also influence her uh, a normal menstrual cycle. Yeah. So her secondary sexual characteristics are normal. There's no hysterism, schism, any or any other systemic diseases. Blood pressure 145, 90, so it's actually hypertensive. Okay, looking at the body weight and also the hypertension, that means it doesn't mean that people who are thin will not get hypertension. Looking at her age, why is she having hypertension at the age of 30? Could it be because um, there's decreased estrogen? Yes, because of a decrease in estrogen, that probably also hardening the blood vessels. Okay, that can basically lead to arteriosclerosis and she's likely to have also hypertension. And we know that estrogen actually causes vasodilation most of the time, yeah? So it actually helps it relax the small muscles, yeah? To some extent, so it can cause vasodilation. So without estrogen, it actually increases the blood pressure to result in vasoconstriction. Yeah. Pulse rate 90, I think it's a bit high. Pelvic examination, barely powerable. That means basically there's the ovary is not powerable. Okay. So the laboratory findings, uh, urine pregnancy test so negative results, she is not pregnant. Serum FSH are at high level, then normal range, while the serum prolactin, testosterone, progesterone, estrogen level are lower than normal. So the FBG, the rest of them are basically within the normal range. So the kidney function, electrolytes, and everything are okay. Okay, so this is basically quite related to your lab result. I mean, so your PBL, right? Okay, so diagnostic laboratory shows that her uterine cavity is normal with no sign of enterometrosis because the mother has that. That's why they do the, the laboratory scan, uh, laparoscopy. Philippine tube are open with no sign of tubular obstruction, as Ruben says, that can also lead to infertilities. So without uh, with that, so she probably have also a normal, basically the structure of the reproductive system. Okay, diagnosis, she's diagnosed with uh, primary infertility due to premature ovarian failure. Okay, and that is mainly due to the loss of function of the ovary before the age of 40. Okay, this is primary infertility, yeah? Because she never has had children before. The ovary are no longer uh, responding to the circulating FSH uh, to produce the estrogen, the NWT infertile eggs. So the ovary is likely appeared to be uh, basically shrink. So she is recommended for the counseling with the ONG and her husband attended all the VC. Okay, provide support, support. So now we look at the questions. Explain the reason why the patient has been very irregular menses and why she is sometimes missing her period. So your answer, basically the patient has, anyone? What have you found? Uh, is it because the ovaries are not able to respond to the hormones released by the pituitary? So the cycle is not able to occur as normal? Okay. You can give many reasons. One, as we have gone through, basically she is thin because of the BNI is low. So basically, they, uh, you can talk about the adipocyte not releasing enough uh, FS, uh, this uh, leptin that can influence uh, the, the FSH level, LH level, basically uh, it re result in irregular menstrual cycle. Or she is because, yes. For leptin, um, what does it do? Is it negative feedback or like how does it, what effect negative. does it have? Okay. Leptin have a positive feedback on the GNRH and FSH and LH level. Okay, so for right. girls who actually attain early menarche, generally they are, um, I would consider, I don't know what you call fat, or basically they have put on enough body weight to basically increase leptin secretion that influence the, uh, the GNRH pulse release. So it's positively influencing the GNRH pulse release, so she basically are able to cycle earlier. 
Okay, that's happened because when people from a poor neighborhood, basically now they have better nutrition, that also uh, result in basically uh, these uh, girls come into Menaki earlier. Okay. Oh, but uh, Dr. Yeah. I thought obesity is interrelated with infertility. I would not want to say fat, that's why. <laughs> Enough body weight, Ruben, sorry, not fat, yeah? If fat, then basically the estrogen level will be basically much uh, affected and that basically also reduced. So it's attaining the normal, uh, actually the above normal weight, then she basically will carry into menarche earlier. So okay, everyone. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so doctor, can, if yeah, someone yeah. has lost their menses due to uh, extreme loss of weight, in order yes. for them to actually get back their menses, they need to eat more fat? Or they need no, to gain they, weight? They, they eat a proper nutrition to gain back the weight. Mm, okay. Yeah. The main thing is nutrition. Actually, it's the energy uh, balance in the body that is more important. But we actually, when the researcher actually go into that, they basically found that adiposite helps in the sense that it improves or release more leptin uh, if the body weight improves, then it helps to basically uh, regulate back the menstrual cycle. Yeah. So you can explain many reasons here. You can give anyone stress. You can actually talk about exercise if she's doing that. Or you can talk about the body weight that can actually affect the irregular menses, yeah? And you can justify why sometimes she misses her period because of the stress related. Okay, so patient like this is considered secondary amenorrhea or primary amenorrhea? Secondary. Is secondary. Why secondary? Hazi, is that you? Uh, no, uh, that can... Because okay, uh, so. it has... Uh, first menses. Yeah, some of them we have discussed in our PBR. So basically, she has actually has the menses, so it's considered secondary, yeah, not primary. Okay, so uh, you must be able. Sorry. Yeah, Ruben. Yeah, doctor, is it okay if I say that she missed her periods because of um she does not have a, a luteal phase, no corpus luteal phase. But initially, she was cycling normally. I mean, a normal because she actually has an a normal period before the menstrual cycle actually stops. Question is why she has an irregular menses. Okay, as we already discussed in class, luteal phase are fixed at 14 days. The one that's a normal, usually the follicular phase. So, okay, Robert? Uh, but if, if she means that missed period would mean that she did not have any uh, uh, um, endometrial slowing off, right? So that would mean that she did not have, she did not form the corpus luteum as well, right? Yeah, but she says that she, the, the question asked is for the patient irregular menses and also why sometimes she miss. When sometimes she miss the period, basically uh, there is no cycle that is happening. Then we can, you can talk about the, the, there is no basically follicular development. Okay, but in this case about the irregular cycles is mainly due to the abnormal follicular phase or short-term follicular phase. Still okay, Ruben? Okay, okay, got it, doctor. Uh, doctor, yes. um, can we also include her diagnosis for question number nine? The fact okay. that she has um, premature ovarian failure. That's yeah. the reason for her regular menstrual cycle. But that is more for of missing the period. Basically, she's called complaining about the pregnancy that she is not having. That would be a better answer. Mm. The way now to explain this question is basically why she has irregular menses. Mainly look, look at the body weight, look at the stress factors that she's having that actually affect the menstrual cycle. So actually, I want you all to basically really understand about how menstrual cycle is actually influenced by all these hormones. And you must be very familiar about the follicular phase and also the, uh, the luteal phase. But luteal phase, basically, they are quite fixed. So usually the follicular phase that is usually uh, affected by this. Uh, hormonal levels or hormonal influence. Yeah. So we very clear about how the menstrual is actually gone through the cycles and what are the factors that affect that cycles to occur. Okay. Yeah. So explains why patient gonadotropin are higher than normal range while the serum testosterone level are lower than the normal range. This is basically now going looking at her complaints that she has uh, not having had missed her cycles and she has says that she has missed her cycle 
sorry, uh, on the pre class, what she says that she has not been able to get pregnant for the last five years. But it never says anything about her stopping menses. Sorry, my she, she time is terrible. Irregular menses, I think. Oh, they were just talking basically on the irregular menses and oh, yeah. Okay. So basically, she has the irregular menses. Yeah. So, but that also explains why the uh, gonadotropin is higher than normal. So you can experience that. Right. Here, you basically can actually refer to the diagnosis looking at primary infertility due to premature ovarian failures. And you can experience that because basically there's no follicular development. So there's no formation of corpus luteum. So basically no estrogen production. So basically there's no uh, estrogen uh, negative feedback on the hypothalamus. That's why the hypothalamus uh, is not releasing the GnRH. Okay, the FSH level is basically then going up, skyrocketing. Basically it's higher than normal. Is that okay? Um, doctor, the pre-class mentions that she mm -hmm. missed her answers altogether. Yeah, so that also add to this why she has a higher than normal gonadotropin level. So it's basically okay. just due to lack of negative feedback by the sex hormones. Yes. Produced. Okay. Mainly the estrogen, basically, and also actually inhibin. And we know that basically uh, the granulosa cell also produce inhibin to inhibit that the uh, FSH and FSH level on the pituitary, yeah. But estrogen is basically higher out on the uh, the the hypothalamus and also the pituitary. Uh, wait, doctor, sorry. Inhibin only acts to inhibit the FSH, right? On yes. the pituitary, not on the hypothalamus itself. No, yeah. it's mainly on the FSH in the pituitary. OK, but so you can actually explain both. Yeah, you can talk about estrogen. So I would probably say estrogen would be a better answer rather than just talking about inhibin. But the main thing okay. is she is not producing, sorry. Yeah. Can you also involve progesterone as well? Because it also has negative feedback in the early luteal phase. Yeah, it can. But the main thing is basically there is no uh, formation of the corpus luteum. No follicular development, so no formation of corpus luteum. No. So you, you can talk about progesterone, there's no problem, but mainly here is we are focusing on estrogen because there's no estrogen production, so she is not cycling. Okay. So uh, 11, explain the biosynthesis structure action of GNRH. Um, doctor? Yeah. Yes. Uh, should we, like, uh, like how Jana explained it was, there was a lack of negative feedback, right? Or is it more uh, suitable to say because of the negative feedback mechanism from the low estrogen is what causes the uh, the FSH and LH levels to be higher? Yeah, you can say that. But the fourth, most important thing is there is no follicular development. So there is no formation of corpus luteum. And therefore, there is no estrogen production. And then you can talk about the negative feedback of estrogen. Still okay, right. yeah. Yes, thank you. Okay, so for the bio biosynthesis structure and action of GnRH, I think we basically know that GnRH is a protein, it's a peptide hormones, right? It's not a steroid, yeah? Because we are focusing so much on steroids, sometimes you tend to confuse that it's actually a steroid. It's not a steroid. So all these uh, hypothalamus pituitary hormones are all uh, peptide hormones or protein hormones, yeah? So we can explain how these uh, glycoprotein hormones are being secreted. Yeah, is there any possibility that the patient GnRH gonadotropin is not normally functioned? Is there a possibility that they are not normally functioned? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, like it's not normally regulated. Yeah. Yes. Because of the negative feedback here, Xiaoming, it will be better we talk about the negative feedback and basically that is not normally function, so there is no negative feedback. So basically that's why this is uh, being affected. Okay, so you can justify that, I think that should be okay. And then we draw draw a diagram to show the short loop and the long loop. I think you can do that by now. Okay, the short loop basically we look at the influence on the pituitary and the long one are more towards the hypothalamus. Yeah. Is there any possibility the negative system is not working? 
fine. So yes, the negative feedback is not working. Just a short answer should do. Don't need to write and explain the long thing. Yeah? So there is uh, the negative feedback mechanism is not working. Uh, so it's not working. Yeah. Um, then we talk about predict the changes in the security phase of the hypothalamus. Okay, you can look at how this hormone, when they are over secretion or under secretion, uh, how this is being affected. And I think that should be okay. You can answer this question unless you have anything you want to ask on question 13. No? Okay, I think here, yeah, is there any question? No. Okay. Um, I just want the there. video just to show up. Yes. Uh, uh, so you said that uh, the no negative feedback mechanism is not working, right? But uh, that is supposed to be the normal one, right, doctor? Because uh, normal. in because in the in the patient situation, the low estrogen also has its own negative feedback mechanism, right? Yes. So the thing is, there any possibility that negative system is not working well in this patient? Yes, it's not working. It's not working well, meaning that uh. the so it's not, no. but not enough to it's like suppress. Yeah, as wanted. Yeah, so it's different. not working correctly in this patient. Yes. Yes. No, yes. Yeah, not working as it should, basically, as it should. Yeah. yeah. It is sort of working, but not at the optimal level. Yeah. 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 Okay, shall we? Yeah. Okay, that. Okay. So you can. If you want to draw, I hope you can see the pictures on the board. Yeah. If you want, you can actually draw this. This is just a very simple drawing on the board. Can you see that? Yeah. Yes, sir. Then. Okay. Yeah. So we are talking about stress. Basically, stress releasing CRH that basically inhibit this. Uh, the new, basically, you know the hypothalamus neurons. Okay, either the acute nucleus, okay, that basically suppress it. So it's negative feedback and suppress it from releasing GnRH. Even exercise. Exercise is not like the light exercise. What we mean is the extreme exercise that the patient or the person do. People who are very active in sports, they're basically releasing too much dopamine, which also negative feedback onto this, uh, the, the neuron, okay, the nucleus, that basically also inhibit that. And also, as we know, GABA, there are many things that uh, actually happens in the brain that have GABA that also can negatively feedback onto the uh, the patient. So you can have stress, you can have emotional. So all these are basically related. So patients who have emotional like depression and all these things, or emotional uh, factors like losing some uh, loved one or something like that, that can also affect uh, the release of GNRH. Yeah, and we can actually draw that basically if there is a follicles, then estrogen will negative and positively feedback depend on the stages of the menstrual cycle. It's in the early phase, it will be negative feedback and then when towards the, the mid-cycle, then it positive feedback to increase the LH secretion. Okay, as so, I said, yeah. In people who are depressed and everything, um, is it because yeah. of GABA? It's more related to GABA, yes. Okay. Yeah. There's more emotional aspect of that. Then you can look at the, uh, the, the, the emotional aspect that basically suppress the release of GNRH. So people who are actually, or couples who have actually had the first children and then they actually, the second one is actually difficult they to have, actually, especially the ladies, because it's basically emotional uh, suppressed. So they actually need to undergo a uh, psychiatric or psych counseling to actually help them to get back to the normal cycles, yeah? So this is mainly due to the GABA effect, the negative feedback onto the patient, okay? So here basically briefly explains how this is influenced by all these things. So if this is negative feedback, basically we know GNRH, but that thing is positive, then you have GRNAs release, then you have LH, FSH, and the formation of a corpus luteum and also the ovulation that happens, yeah? But in this patient, basically, she does not have enough uh, ovarian reserve or follicular reserve, so she is actually now uh, depleted. Yeah. So question asked is number fourteen. What does ovarian reserve? Uh, what does what is ovarian reserve? And does the patient have a normal ovarian reserve? So we know that basically he does not or she does not have that uh, enough uh, follicles available. Uh. Is that okay? So question fourteen. Uh, 
Yep. Doctor, yes. technically her ovarian reserve is normal, but she's having a receptor deficit problem, right? Yep. Usually, patients like this, they will come during puberty, their ovarian reserve is much lower than the normal uh, patient. She will undergo a few normal cycles and then she starts to deplete the ovarian uh, follicles. By the time she reached about 25 to 30, she basically almost depleted all the, uh, the follicles. Okay, so usually by about 30, or uh, like the case, uh, the PBL case, it went out to about 39. That's where she then uh, basically have depleted all the, all, uh, the ovarian follicles. So she's not able to ovulate or undergo or follicular development. Wait, so okay. doctor, yeah, the ovaries do yeah. not respond to the, the hormones and they also have low follicle. Yes. Low follicles are normal. Even usually if normally if the, uh, the ovary has in or have this primary follicles, they normally, they normally will be able to undergo follicular development and they normally will be able to respond to hormonal changes. Okay, but in this case, she does not have Actually, as early as if they actually test the ovary earlier than uh, during or uh, after puberty. Sorry, my line is bad. So after puberty, that means basically her ovary reserve is very low, but usually people do not test that. They only come back after when they have uh, not able to get children, then they will start to look into all these problems. The question is, can she still get pregnant? Or I mean, can she still have children? Is there any possibility that she can have children? Yes, no? No. Low chances, I guess. Very low chances. It's very low chances, but now you can actually artificially help the patient. She can still actually get by actually harvesting however follicles that they have and basically help to actually, uh, they give a very high level of FSH to actually stimulate the balance of the follicle to develop and then harvest that and fertilize that in vitro. Because basically her ovary, uh, her, main, uh, her uterus is normal, then she can actually uh, undergo hormonal treatments to actually uh, help to get her pregnant, okay? But it's a tough process to do that. It's actually difficult to get her to get pregnant, even though she can use it, uh, do artificial uh, treatment, yeah? So question 15, does so, OB, yes. In this condition, like premature ovarian failure, what exactly happens? Like, is it a receptor deficit that the, that the ovary is not able to respond to the hormones? Or like, what's the main issue? The main issue is the primary for the, or the primordial follicles is depleted. Before so they actually develop. Have, so there's no receptor deficit. There's nothing like they can't. Yeah. So the FSH, LH can't bind because there's no like receptors it's, it's for them both. to bind to. It's both. She is depleted and she has a receptor deficit. Because when there is no uh, follicles, basically, so all these receptors is not present there. Okay. So it's just like receptors. About, okay. What about the yes. receptor defect? I've read it somewhere. Yeah, it, it has, but usually it's very rare cases of that happening. It can happen, but it's very rare, John. And these are usually genetically uh, problems. And it's actually in the usually in the family line if they have that. And usually they did not survive a lot because they, I mean, this family line doesn't survive because they are not able to produce children. So usually it just basically die off after a few generations. So, okay, John. That's why I say it's very rare. Yeah. So, okay, we can describe, I think we are still in question 15, right? So you can describe about oogenesis and the relationship with the ovarian follicles. I think to answer Jana, your questions about this, basically, as we know that during puberty, generally about 10% of the follicles that she has will be there to basically develop into uh, primary follicles and all this thing, yeah? Uh, secondary and finally, this kind of follicle. But generally people in this, stage, they actually has less than 1% of the primordium follicles during puberty. And that's why it doesn't last that long, usually by about three, four years or even five years after that is most of this 
uh, promote all the primary follicles has already depleted in the ovary. Is that okay, Jana? Yeah, yeah, doctor. All right, thank you. I just wanted to clear that because I was hearing receptor deficits and I was like, okay, which one is it? <laughs> receptor deficit, as I say, is a very rare case. As I say, if in the long term, this family line doesn't last. It's basically is going to basically die off after one or two generations. Usually, they disappear. Okay, so I think you can describe about oogenesis now and how does that related to the ovarian follicles. Yeah, so the main thing you must be able to describe actually uh, question system is more important. Yeah, the most important thing is basically you must be able to describe the two cell model of the ovarian uh, stereogenesis, uh, mainly how the uh, two cell model looking at decarsian and the ovarian, uh, decarsian and granulus cell. Okay, and these are not over, these are not the primary, these are not the, uh, the, the how we say, the over, okay. These are the cells that surround the ova. Yeah, make sure that you are very clear about the Tika cell and Tika cell are basically located outside the, basically outside the follicles, outside in the sense that it's actually recruited from the stroma of the ovary, okay, and become part of the uh, follicular cell, the Tika cell, and we know that Tika cell basically has LH receptors, whereas the uh, granulosa cell, they are actually lying inside the follicles, Okay, because they are lack of this uh, blood supply or nearer to the blood supply, basically, they only have FSH receptors. Yeah, so we can explain that. And the important thing is this uh, Tika cell is producing the androgen. Okay, that basically then uh, pass to the granulosa cell. It can basically diffuse to the granulosa cell and the granulosa cell with the FSH able to uh, produce the enzyme aromatase that convert the androgens into estrogen and this Tika cell is the one also the androgen that is produced can actually undergo to become testosterone and usually some of this amount is actually secreted into the blood plasma I mean into the blood basically for normal menstrual cycle okay but normally here this is how you can actually explain that okay so we I provide you the hint and looking the enzyme if you want to go into the detail on starting uh, let's say from the Tika cell formation, uh, the cholesterol converted to prednisolone and prednolone and all this, you can actually go through that process. But I just want a brief, simple um, uh, explanation. Basically, the Tika cell convert cholesterol to androgen. That is the direct one. You don't need all the details. This is more biochemistry. Yeah. And basically, the androgen diffuse to the granulosa cell and the granulosa cell under the stimulus of this FSH because they have FSH receptors then it can undergo aromatase. Uh, it can produce aromatase and undergo, uh, convert the uh, androgen into estrogen. Okay, why is the Tika cell cannot do that? It doesn't have aromatase. Uh, yeah, but why it doesn't have aromatase? No FSH receptor. I think that is also one of the answer because basically she, it doesn't have the FSH receptors. Yeah, because it doesn't have the FSH receptor, that's why it cannot actually uh, form the aromatase, not like the granulosa cell. So when the granulosa cell have the uh, LH and FSH, it does not depend on the LH uh, uh, Tika cell anymore after the ovulation when it becomes a granulosa luteal cell. And this granulosa luteal cell will still produce uh, estrogen and the Tika cell now can actually produce uh, finally because they have already become a luteal cell. Now they're basically able to undergo uh, the aromatase, or basically they are able to undergo the process of converting the androgen now into uh, progesterone. Okay, whereas granulosa cell is the one that produces estrogen and also progesterone, but mostly estrogen. Yeah. Okay, I think that's all about question 16. Question 17 uh, When and in what cell is LH expressed during menstrual cycle? I think that's already understood. Yeah? Explain. So make sure that you must be able to describe the menstrual cycle and it means mainly constitute two cycles. That is the ovarian cycle and the uterine cycle. So you can relate that to question 18. Okay. And you must be able to explain during what happens to the ovarian cycle. So you have the follicular phase and also ovulation and finally the uh, luteal phase. Okay. Whereas in the uterine cycle or the endometrium cycle, you have this basically the proliferative phase and also the secretory phase. 
Okay, so the prolactin phase are mainly influenced by the hormone estrogen, and the secretory phase mainly influenced by the uh, the progesterone. Yeah. Whereas the ovary phase, mainly you're looking at FSH and LH. Looking at follicular phase, that's why the FSH basically is there. Okay, then you have the luteal phase, sorry, the ovulation, ovulation phase. This is where uh, the LH level surge that allow ovulation to occur. But after that, luteal phase, what happens to the hormones? Why is the um, estrogen production still? Sorry. After the luteal phase, I mean, after ovulation, during the luteal phase, why is the hormones, estrogen, or progesterone keep on producing, even though the FSH and FSH level is low? Is that in the case fertilization has occurred? No. If no fertilization occurred, and yet still the cell is able to produce estrogen and progesterone. No, right. I think you mentioned prostaglandin in the mid-course. Yeah, it's during the end of the menstrual cycle that then allowed this, uh, uh, the corpus luteum to actually uh, luteinize. Yeah? But during this stage, it does not really depend on LH and FSH anymore because the cell now already converts to become a, a corpus luteum or a luteal cell. That's why it becomes an endocrine gland by itself. It does not depend on LH and FSH anymore. Even right. though the level is low, it can still keep on producing uh, the estrogen that is required, uh, the progesterone that is required. But it cannot last forever because after towards the three, four days before that, it actually starts to reduce. So by about seven to 10 days, basically the estrogen and progesterone level start to reduce. Okay, for no apparent reason, we do not know why because it's not going to last, because now the level of SH and LH is basically very, very low. So in the beginning, it still depends, even though the LH level and FSH level is there, but it's getting lower, okay? It helps the cell to actually cycle or to start producing the estrogen and progesterone. But after a while, it gets too low, so basically the estrogen and progesterone levels start to decrease again. Stay okay? But as the estrogen level or progesterone levels get low, even lower by the three, four days before that, then they will start happening, prostaglandin start to be produced by the, the uterine cell that cause the lutealysis of this uh, corpus luteum. Okay. So doctor, you're yeah. saying that after luteinization takes place, like we've converted to thicker luteal cells and granulosa luteal cells, we no longer need LH to maintain the corpus luteum. We need not really need in the sense that basically uh, corpus luteum, this basically the luteal cell or the thicker luteal cell, it still responds to the minimum level or the decreasing level of LH. Okay. And the granulosa cell basically also respond, respond to that, uh, LH and FSH, and it's still able to produce the estrogen progesterone. That's why the level is still increasing, even though the LH and FSH level is actually decreasing. Okay. By about 10 days after that, so it basically about seven to 10 days, it basically then reached the lowest level. Now basically it's not able to sustain the production of estrogen and progesterone. We do not know why, okay? But it's not able to sustain, that's why the estrogen and progesterone level start to actually drops. Is that okay? Mm, yes, doctor. Okay, any other questions? No, I will just move on. I think we are taking out more than one hour now. What is the normal response of the ovary to a decline FSH level during the follicular phase? And we know that now during the formation of these follicles, uh, during the first three to four days, basically, is all the follicle will develop. Okay, By the three, four days, the fourth day afterward, five to six to almost 10 days, this is the time selection happens. So you start to select which are the follicles that is going to become the guardian follicle. Okay, once selection have actually occurred, this guardian follicle will keep on producing uh, estrogen. Okay, actually the increase in the FSH receptors is not due to the increase in the receptors on the uh, granulosa cell. It's actually the increase in the number of granulosa cell that have the FSH receptors that is able to respond to the decline in FSH. Do you understand that? Yes. 
Oh, so doctor, it's not because of increase. The increase in FSH receptor is not due to the number present in the granulosa cell. It's actually due to the increase in number of granulosa cell, which means that now the granulosa cell will develop more, more in this graphene follicles compared to those that are not recruited. So basically, they do not have enough uh, granulosa cell. Okay. So on average, actually scientists have done the research and says that it's in each granulosa cell, you have about 1,500 1, uh, FSH uh, receptors. So it's the number of granulosa cells that actually increases, not the FSH receptors in individual granulosa cells. Yeah? I hope you are not confused by that. Is that okay? Now, as the number of granulosa cells become more, now it's able to respond because now we have more FSH receptors comparatively. That's why it's able to still re able to respond to the FSH and it keep on producing the estrogen level, which negative feedback to actually suppress the LH and FSH level. But it's because of the LH that is still present and the Tika cell is still able to produce the androgen. So this cells that are not, or these uh, follicles that are not recruited, they basically now produce a lot of androgen, but that androgen cannot be aromatized to become estrogen. So it finally basically kill off the, the, the remaining cell that is present in the atric follicles. I hope you understand the process. And this is very important for you to know why uh, one of the guards is selected as a graphene follicles, yeah? Doctor. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. It's, um, yeah. For the um, increase in the number of S FSH receptors on the granulosa cells, it's in response to the increasing estrogen, right? Yes. Okay. S3 estrogen allowed this uh, follicular cell, uh, the granulosa cell, to become more. So All it right. multiply more granulosa cell. Yeah. Yes, Ruben. No, I was just going to say that you're just saying that um, the factor that determines the choosing of the graphene follicle basically is determined by the proliferation so, rate of the granulosa cell, right? Due to estrogen. Due to estrogen, okay. Because these graphene follicles now, or the tertiary follicles now producing a lot of estrogen, they basically allow more granulosa cell to form in inside these uh, follicles. They increase the FSH uh, receptors. Uh the number of FSH receptors, yeah. Okay, so basically that you can experience that why this is a the selection happens. Is this happening to the ovary of the patient? No, because she doesn't have any follicles, so it's not happening, yeah. So question 21, describe the normal process ovulation formation decline of corpus luteum. I think by now you should be very clear on how this is happening, okay. And which of the following, which of these processes are not occurring in this patient? None. Basically, she doesn't have any follicle because she has depleted all her follicles. So that's why her menses actually stop function. Oh, sorry, the function. Basically, she missed all the menses. She has actually stopped uh, having menstrual cycle. Or she has secondary amenorrhea. Lah. Okay, so question 22. Describe the hormonal regular estrogen progesterone biosynthesis, which I have already discussed just now about the two cells. So identify the cell, we already done that, and how they are degraded and removed from the body. Okay, estrogen is difficult in the sense that basically they are steroid hormones and they all are metabolized basically in the liver, okay, undergo the process of uh, um, conjugation and also the uh, sulfurcation and also uh, glucuronidation, yeah. Basically, that is the process they undergo in the liver and they are converted to other less uh, form. So this estrogen that have been conjugated, basically they are excreted in the urine. Some of this estrogen is actually, some of them, they actually still excreted as the, their, their original form. And this when released into the environment, okay, let's say in some of this animal production, they basically have a lot of this, let's say like cattle, they release this, I mean, the waste into the into the waterway. It actually influences uh, the water. It is present, the estrogen basically is present in the water. That can actually affect the male function on spermatogenesis if they happen to drink the water. But that's okay. Basically, what I'm trying to say is uh, 
this estrogen and progesterone are quite difficult to actually uh, denature or basically uh, make into an inactive form. It's difficult to metabolize. But all these are metabolized in the liver, okay? And they then will be excreted in the kidney. Okay, yeah? Yeah, no question. Okay, so we move to 21. This is the target organs of estrogen, and you can describe that. So I would expect you to at least able to now explain the function of estrogen or action of estrogen. Okay. So the most important thing basically you know about the negative and positive feedback on the pituitary gonadotropes. Right? And you know that basically it's important estrogen is mainly for the proliferative phase of the endometrium, mainly it stimulate the growth of the endometrium. And also, it stimulates the breast uh, development, the mainly for the ductal growth. Yeah. And it also stimulates the ciliogenesis in the oviduct. Okay. And the most important thing is stimulate the secretion of thin watery uh, mucus by the cervix. So, these are the things that you must be able to give one example. The effect of estrogen on non reproductive uh, tissue, you can either talk about reproductive tissue. If non reproductive, you can talk about uh basically it increased general vasodilation yeah or it can actually cause bone mineralization and we know that lack of estrogen that's why it causes osteoporosis yeah? okay and it increased the hdl and also decreased uh, uh ldl production so mainly it has some effect on the heart function so it's uh, protecting the heart and also the arteries okay that you can give whatever that mainly if you know that uh, estrogen function, then you can actually give one of that. Or if I ask you about the the effect of progesterone, can you give one of the action of a progesterone effect? Then you can give mainly to maintain pregnancy or whatever that you want to talk about. I hope you can find that out. Yeah. Okay, 24. What is the response of pituitary gonadotropes to the date of the corpus lifting at the end of menstruation? At, men at the end, actually, what I mean is at the end of menstruation, menstruation or at menstruation. Yeah, or at the end of menstrual cycle. So mainly when there is the when at the end of the menstrual cycle, basically the progesterone level is down, estrogen level is down. Now there will be an increased secretion of FSH. So there is no more negative inhibition on the gonadotropes. Now we start to release FSH and also LH. Yeah? So they will start the cycle of uh, follicular genesis in a normal patient. I mean, in a normal person uh, or normal woman. But in this patient, this does not happen because she doesn't have a corpus luteum. Okay. What would be the outcome of truncated uh, luteal phase with early death of the corpus luteum on endometrial development? Okay, this is what happens when you have a shorter luteal phase. And generally, we say that corpus luteum doesn't normally change that much. It's usually about 14 days. The one that changed is mainly uh, due to the follicular phase. But if that happens in truncated uh, luteal phase, then there will be basically not enough time for implantation. That means the endometrium has not had time to basically develop. The blood vessel is not fully developed to, be, to develop secretory activities. It will not be fully able to express surface protein for implantation, and then it will basically undergo early menses. Is that okay? Any question on that? No? Okay. How is stress related to the condition in the patient? We have already discussed, and also I will show you the, the drawing on the board. So, if that happens, if let's say the patient still have this uh, uh, enough follicles, can there possibility? Uh, help her to get back to her menses. Can that be done? Yeah. Yeah, she can either change her lifestyle, don't take all this stressful job. I mean, that can happen to you if you are actually having exam and all these things, sometimes it also can actually affect your menses cycle. Okay, the same thing is this patient, she can change her lifestyle, improve nutrition, okay, light exercise, okay, and also uh, reduce stress that can actually elevate the condition yeah okay that's basically about the woman's story now we look at the man's story okay the husband is a secondary school teacher with degree in Islamic studies they are renting house three bedroom in a quiet neighborhood in the village okay 
So you done basically her husband function, review normal sperm factor, uh, male factors, and also the sperm densities. Yeah. So basically, all the hormonal levels are normal. So describe the significant of hypothalamic control or testicular function in a normal, healthy man compared that to the female. So is the man cycling have the same cycles like the female on the GnRH and FSH level? Slightly different because men don't have positive feedback. Okay, so men basically have only negative feedback by testosterone testosterone and also inhibitor yeah. okay that negative feedback so does men undergo the cycles production cycles like the female mm, no not really not really yeah okay now what happens to the spermatogonian at puberty basically it will start to develop and then you will start to undergo uh, division and formation of sperm uh, or spermatogenesis uh. Yeah, so you can explain that. So what hormones regulate the function of Cetoli cell? FSH. FSH, yeah. So Cetoli cell is basically closely related to the granulosa cell. Yeah, but where do you find Cetoli cell? In the seminiferestable. It must be in the seminiferestable, not in the, in the testes, yeah? No. When you talk about testes, it's very general. It can be anywhere in the testes, but almost 80 to 90 percent. I think 90 percent of the testes is basically composed uh, consists of seminiferous tubule. But where can you find the uh, the lead itself? In the interstitium, outside, yeah. outside the base. Yeah. In this case, you can say it's actually in the testes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Whereas the tulisa is more in the seminiferous tubule, whereas the the, the lead cell is actually in the interstitial of the inside the testis. So basically, the stroma of the testis is basically have this uh, L, uh, lead cell. Yeah. So what protein and hormones are produced by this and what mechanism? So we know that now. It's a lead cell. Sorry. Uh, okay. I, I yeah. unmuted by accident. Okay. Okay. So Cetoli cell produce what? ABP. The most important thing, the ABP. Inhibin. Yeah. Sorry? Sorry? Inhibin. Inhibin and? Antimolarian uh, one. Yeah, AMP. that's during the, the fetus. Estrogen phase. in low levels. Estrogen, yes, because it has aromatics. But most important thing, it's able to produce the growth factors that influence lead itself to actually grow. Yeah. So important thing is basically they are not actually important. They are all important. So androgen binding protein, what is the function of androgen binding protein? We need to bind the testosterone. Yeah? It's not inside the cell. This protein is secreted outside the cell in the adluminal compartment. Why are they important to be secreted outside the adluminal compartment? I mean, in the adluminal compartment, outside the cell. Why is ABP important? Um, to prevent, uh, basically to trap, to trap the testosterone, the testosterone inside the yeah, human. Trap the testosterone to avoid it from entering the Sertoli cells because if it enters, it will be converted to estrogen, the aromatase. Yes, because if you don't have this protein, basically most of this testosterone will be converted into uh, estrogen. Then it's not going to become a male there. You will have problems of a feminine, I mean, the gender uh, crisis. Yeah. So. Androgen binding protein is important mainly to trap the uh, testosterone that is in the that get to the the Cetoli cell that cross the blood testis barrier. Okay, that allow it to trap to be a uh, very high level. And why is the testosterone level in the aluminum compartment need to be high enough, like two hundred times higher than the normal plasma level? Is that important? Yes. For what purpose? Spermatogenesis. Yes, the main thing it allowed the the spermatogodian to undergo spermatogenesis. 
what happens if this level is lower, the testosterone level is lower, let's say it's normal, I mean the same level as those in the plasma, then spermatogenesis will not occur, which means that the spermatogonium will be able to undergo the cycle, will depend on the testosterone level at the at luminal compartment. Yeah. From there, it can then undergo. If not, it will not be able to undergo the spermatogenesis, basically the formation of primary spermatozoa. Okay, from there, it will then undergo secondary spermatozoa to become the, finally, the spermatozoa. Yeah, so that process is very important, mainly due to the ABP, the binding, the testosterone level. So allow that level to increase higher than normal. Yeah, I mean, 200 times higher than those in the blood plasma. So what is the function of this? Totally cell. You can give any one of the function. The most important thing is a barrier to the plasma. Nourish right. the sperms. It mainly nourish the spermatozoa so that they are being fed. Okay, the process to produce a sperm takes almost about 74 days, starting from that, but they have some sort of rest period in between. Okay. It also secretes other luminal fluid. You can look at that, and it actually also become a phagocytic uh, effect. Basically, I'll consume or actually take out all the defective uh, sperms. Okay, why is there no macrophages in the egg luminal compartment? Why the job has to be done by the Sertoli cell? Is there any macrophages inside there? No, it's because of the blood justice barrier which prevents them. Yeah, so it's no, so it's basically immune, immune free uh, environment. Yeah, some of these uh, viruses, as I mentioned, like the Zika virus, is actually found in there because you no know, immune cell is there, and even antibodies that can get there. So basically, they are protected uh, environment, so they are basically very. Uh, it's a very restricted area. Yeah. Okay, so that is about all about sutile cell. So you can name two endocrine products. So you can do that. Uh, question twenty nine. What are the two hormones produced by sutile cell? Testosterone, estrogen. Inhibin. Yeah, the most important thing is inhibin and actually testosterone. You can actually name two or anti murinda that is during the fetal stage. Yeah. yeah. Okay, now what is the blood testing barrier and the significant? What is the relation between this and also that uh, the egg luminal compartment? So I think that we have already discussed that, so you will understand that. Okay, now where are the cell found? We already discussed that. Okay, they are actually found outside the centriferous tubule, yeah. Basically, in the interstitial. That's why they are known sometimes known as interstitial cell of the testis, yeah. So you can say they are found in the testis. It's okay, but mainly they are outside the centriferous tubule. Okay, what hormones is produced by the lidic cell? Testosterone. Yeah, testosterone. So mainly that. So what is the psychological uh, physiological effect of this hormone on the male? Uh, male characteristic development. Okay. But most important thing actually testosterone is to initiate and maintain of this spermatogenesis. Okay, by basically acting through the cell, mainly doing uh, acting through the um, the ABP that it has. Yeah. It also have a negative feedback onto the uh, GN, uh, hypothalamus to reduce GnRH level. If the level is high, okay, it also inhibit uh, LH secretion. Okay, so these are the things that you can talk about uh, about this. Uh, okay, but the most important thing basically they are for sex drive and also enhance aggressive behavior. Okay, so the males become more aggressive, but it also stimulate erythropoietin secretion by the kidney. Yeah, it helps in that. So you can actually talk about that. Then describe the process of somatogenesis. I think that you can do it by now. Is that okay? Briefly, you can basically mention that okay. starting from this, yeah, spermatogonium, uh, they undergo mitotic division, form themselves, and basically renew themselves. Why does the spermatogonium need to renew itself? Why not it undergo my meiosis division? Do you think about that? Wait, doctor, what's the question? Why does the spermatogonium only undergo mitotic division, not meiosis division, to renew itself? To increase the number first. 
<laughs> okay, um, that's a good question. I, yeah, sorry, Jan. I'm not sure, Doctor. Yeah, the main thing um, is it never. Say it like needs a, yeah. I they never know. undergo mitotic division and uh, meiosis division, yeah, meiosis division, because they have to renew themselves. If not, there will be no more sperm produced. Okay, so because spermatogen is basically like your primordium germ cell, they keep on repeating and developing. And males basically produce billion and trillion and trillions of uh, sperms. If without this process of mitotic division in the spermatogonium, then it will be depleted just like the female, where you have a limited follicles. Okay, that's why the oocyte only undergo meiosis division, not mitotic division. Yeah, whereas spermatogonium they undergo meiotic mitotic division, not meiosis division. So you see the difference? Yeah, they are actually the gamete cells, just like the ova. They are the gamete cells. Okay, so you can explain that. I think I, I think you should be quite clear by now. How is abuse of androgens uh, cause low sperm count? So by now looking at how the hormones actually regulated the spermatogenesis function. So if they abuse or people who took external source of uh, androgens or testosterone, which is basically the anabolic drugs, they basically develop good muscle size and all this thing, but it actually caused the reduction in sperm production. So basically it caused infertility. Yeah? But in the long run, it actually can cause that to happen. So it's not a very good one for them to actually, but we have seen some athletes actually do that and take that, or even bodybuilders. So they usually have low fertility. Yeah. Okay, so what is the role of seminal vesicles and prostate? What is PSA? Okay, so most of this... Yeah, the uh, sperm sorry, sorry, sorry doctor, yeah. can you explain yeah. a little bit more clearly why is it that if you take exogenous testosterone, it, it leads to infertility? Is it because of negative, negative feedback and then... Yes, it's negative feedback, basically suppress the release of GNRH, then you will basically also suppress the LH and FSH level. So we know that when there's low L LH and also SF uh, FSH level, basically the lidic cell is not going to produce the androgen that is required or basically the testosterone that can be actually uh, passed to the sertoli cell or passed to the sertoli cell to be bind in by the ABP in the ad luminal compartment. So basically the level of uh, testosterone in the ad luminal compartment will be low. Okay, but the main thing is ne even though there are some basically still bind there, so it will take time. People who start to abuse the android uh, testosterone will take maybe like years, two, three years later, they will find that they are infertile. Okay, because they still have the reserve of testosterone in the ad luminal uh, level. But now be, without the LH and FSH, basically the lidic cell and the sertoli cell is not going to function. Okay, now you know that sertoli cell is able to survive because of FSH. Now it's not going to produce the ad luminal, uh, sorry, the ABP, not going to produce and not be going, basically going to become the nurse cell. It's going to die off. And it doesn't produce the growth factor, so the LH or the lidic cell is also going to be reduced. And that's why in the long run, basically, it's going to cause reduced production of sperms because of the low testosterone level. Still okay, Ruben? Yeah, yeah, okay, got it. Yeah. You can have very high level of testosterone in the plasma. It's not going to get into the aluminum environment. It is, that is not the main key issue. The main thing is basically negative feedback inhibiting the LH and also the FSH level. That is the most important thing. Okay, so you can experience that. Yeah, okay. Um, also, Doctor, uh, yes. the reason why the exogenous testosterone cannot enter the alumina, is it because uh, it has to pass through the Sertoli cells, causing oh. it to become estrogen or? No, no, no. Oh, no. Testosterone can get into the testis uh, brain barrier. There's no problem the blood testis uh, barrier, there's no problem because they are steroid. They can basically diffuse through. It's more important is because they negative feedback to inhibit the LH and FSH level. They basically suppress the function of LH, uh, lidic cell and cetoli cell. So then, doctor, basically when, like, for example, bodybuilders, they use uh, steroids, right? So yeah, they will yes. only notice the effects after they stop using, right? Oh, Not no. during the... Two, three years after that. If let's say they use for one year and then they stop, 
it don't really affect much on the fertility. They still okay. But after two three years, basically they are going to. I mean, basically, I mean sometimes not two three years, even just after one year of using, they actually reduce the FSH levels. Um, but yeah, you go, uh, uh, by doctor, cut yeah. the uh, exogenous testosterone just uh, help in spermatogenesis as well. But there is no ABP to bind it. Because the sertoli uh, cell is not functioning. And the lady cell cannot grow because sertoli cell is not producing the growth factors. Alright, uh, thank you. Uh, doctor, yeah. can we say the use of exogenous uh, androgen can cause receptor desensitization? No. No. It's the direct inhibition on the GNRH and FSH level. It's not a desensitization. Okay. Yeah, it's yes, a negative we, feedback basically. Yeah, it's a negative feedback immediately. We there is still sometimes, as I say, is the luminal environment still have testosterone level which is quite high. The problem is the sotoli and the lead cell is not able to uh, function. Spermatogenesis can still go on, okay, but probably they are producing more abnormal sperms now because of the sotoli cell is not uh, taking it out or they reduce in number of sertoli cell because of less uh, FSH and LH. And also the lipid cell is not, not there to, to be producing the hormones. Okay. okay. So it's irreversible then, doctor? <clears throat> in the long run, yes. It's, if they really suppress it so much that basically it's going to stop sperm production. Because we do not actually know is it reversible, but in the long run, basically, people who took that for three to four years they are infertile for the rest of their life. Sorry, yeah. Okay, so the role of seminal vesicles and prostate, this mainly contribute to the most volume of the semen. Okay, <clears throat> and what is PSA? And this is the one that you test in the lab. Yeah, and mainly this is mainly known as the prosthetic specific uh, serine protease. In the animals, this is important mainly it helps to break down the, what we call this, the, the semen plug. Okay, some of the animals, they basically prevent other, animal, uh, other male animals from fertilizing the female that they have fertilized. So they form a plug there basically to block this. Okay. Okay, in the semen that contain this are seminal gilium. So basically they form a plug, they basically block the vagina so that the other males cannot fertilize the female. But in human, this is not important because we don't need that. Uh, but they uh, actually can be used to actually test the function of the prostate. So that's why in the lab, they usually test this uh, PSA. Yeah, so I think you already know, so it's okay. Uh, the last question, the process of erections and how GN, uh, does G, uh, CGMP uh, control erection? So CGMP mainly increase the calcium influx, okay, uh, efflux uh, from the vascular swim muscle. So basically it helps to cause uh, contractions. Okay, but if you can decrease the calcium level, so by inhibiting this, basically it helps to promote uh, vasodilation. So we reduce calcium level, we know that basically it's cause uh, swim muscle relaxation, then it will cause a uh, vasodilation. And we know that that is important in erectile, uh, erection, erectile tissue. So penile erectile tissue basically are the cavernous sum muscle that basically allow them to actually expand and allow the blood vessel, uh, the blood to basically fill out the cavernous sum, yeah? So with this basically help in the erection, yeah? I think you can read out on the whole process and uh, I think that's all the question, unless you have things you want to ask. Is that okay? We almost take out one and a half hours. After I'll send the yes. attendance link. Yes, Do please. Do okay. Doctor, yeah. in uh, for erectile dysfunction in uh, elderly male, right? Most of it yes. is due to uh, uh, vascular issues, is it? Yes, usually, but it can be also emotional and all these uh, things. But most of them is, if you look at the psych uh, physiological aspect, basically it's due to the increased sympathetic stimulation that causes uh, the contractions that prevents the uh, the sum muscle from relaxing so it cannot fill up with the, uh, enough blood okay 
And we know that this mainly erection depends on parasympathetic stimulation more than sympathetic stimulation. It's only during the ejaculation that sympathetic uh, play an important role. Is that okay, Ruben? Yeah, yeah, all right. Yeah. So that's why this uh, well graph or synergy field is working by basically inhibiting, okay? It helps by actually uh, inhibiting the PDE5. Okay, with this inhibiting, so the CGMP is basically increased that actually prevents or increasing what we call this uh, myosin phosphatase that actually causes uh, muscle relaxation. So muscle relaxation, yeah. I think you can read that out and uh, we already done even the first year, start from the first year I've been teaching you all about this uh, small muscle relaxation, looking at increased activity of uh, myosin phosphatase. Okay. Doctor, yes. um, I have a question for the um, exogenous androgen. So basically, when you give exogenous androgen, the patient is able to get testosterone and you can cross yes. the blood testis barrier. So yes. spermatogenesis occurs as normal. Yes. So uh, the fertility it is not affected. Can, it, can occur in norm, it can occur because they are still testosterone because you still have ABP there present. But because of negative feedback, it actually reduces the LH and FSH level. Now we know that LH and FSH is very important for these two cells, the lidic cell and uh, Sertoli cell to function. Without FSH, Sertoli cell is not going to become a nerve cell. It's not going to produce the inhibition, I mean, it's not going to produce the growth factor. So basically the LH or the lidic cell is not going to grow. That also going to affect the function of the uh, Sertoli cell in the long run. That's why I say fertility will not affect immediately. It takes time, probably one, two years after that. Uh, so it's like the sperm will be produced, but its maturation will be affected because the sertoli cells are affected and like the lady. Okay. Even the sperm, even the sperm's development will become morphologically will become abnormal, and the sertoli cell is not going to function basically to engulf or clean out all these abnormal cells. So it's going to produce a lot of abnormal uh, sperms, spermatozoa, and which is no. not effective in fertilization. Yes, Jonathan. Any question? No. No. Okay. No. Okay. So that's all. So I will see you on Monday about your um, current update on this uh, reproductive uh, system. So I hope you all can prepare a good uh, video presentation to Dr. Aziz and also Dr. Adukudus, and they will he will both of them is going to evaluate you on your video presentation. Okay, this uh, need a lot of teamwork. Yeah, and you will enjoy the, the the process. So, John, can you start the class on Monday? Okay, doctor. No yeah, problem. start the class. Uh, if Dr. Adukudus or Dr. Aziz is not in, just invite them to join in. I will join in later on and off. I just want to be all over. And also prepare questions for your friends to answer. You have a lot of things and doubt about the, the videos that they present. Also ask them questions. Okay, so this class is mainly for you, okay, to basically find things other than we teach during the classes. Is that okay? Doctor, yes. I have a question. Why was the PBL and the case study having similar cases? It's a bit different. Actually, previously, we have a different PBL. They have actually the morning sickness. They usually, those who are pregnant earlier, they will start to uh, vomit and all these things. But this time we changed that, so now become the same as the case studies. But it's okay because to me is what you are going to uh, face in your uh, exam, the end of course. Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, uh, doctor, they could have made it like PCOS or like you know, so it didn't have to be the same in both. Uh, we it's difficult to develop all these cases, like P, I mean the PBL cases. So I need time to actually develop that. That's the problem. Yeah. We do not focus so much on PCOS because basically you are going to face, uh, do that when you go into our ONG. There will be a lot of questions on that. And they are more clinical rather than physiological, even though there are some physiological aspects. Yeah. OK, doctor. All right, thank you. But I hope that this is more a uh, revision for you to prepare for your short answer questions to SAQ. So I hope that you can actually write, because when you write in, and draw yourself you will remember better than you just copy paste 
and it's going to help you in your short answer questions. Okay. Okay, doctor. Okay, then I will, I expected to see you next following Monday. We have a face-to-face uh, -face exam. Okay, there. Okay, any no other questions? We can finish the class today. Thank you, doctor. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you.